He is the former assistant director and curator of the African American Civil War Museum and Memorial in Washington, D.C. He is one of the foremost authorities on the role of African American soldiers in the Civil War. And he's telling me, as an independent consultant right now, he is curating a new exhibit at the DeSalvo African American Museum in Chicago, Illinois, which will feature the 8th Illinois Infantry, which is a African American National Guard regiment and its participation 100 years in the First World War, because this is a 100 year anniversary of the First World War. So uh, his expertise is wide uh, and it's deep, ladies and gentlemen, not just in the American Civil War, but, but all over. And this topic that he's going to present today, and I have to confess is a topic I told him I wanted him to come and speak on here at the Civil War Museum because I have particular interest in it. So his discussion today will be the United States Colored Troops and their occupation duty between 1865 and 1867 after the American Civil War. And I'm not going to give away the show, and he gave me a little write-up here, but you probably didn't know that the first unit to enter Charleston, South Carolina, I mean, that's the very seat of secession in the Civil War, when Charleston, after the surrender, the first unit to enter that city was a United States Colored Troop unit, was an African American unit. So there are many stories like that, and Harry's going to tell us about that today. So without any further ado, I'm going to have him come up here and give his presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Now, I would say that once I started digging into this story, one of the things is just occupation duty. Occupation duty itself. What I found is that the story begins before 1865. So I'm going to cover a period larger than 1865 to 1867. We're going to focus on United States colored troops. United States Colored Troops. And one of my, I would, I'm going to say, points that I press the most is that we view history from the perspective of the history makers. So how do they view themselves? And when we talk about United States Colored Troops, one of the things I want us to appreciate, they view themselves, okay, I pressed the wrong button. They view themselves as patriots. This is Major Martin Delaney. One of the highest ranking officers among the United States Colored Troops. Actually, in truth, he was not a United States Colored Troop. He served 1865 through 1869 as a major in the regular army. Commissioned, direct commission from President Abraham Lincoln. So he's not really a United States Colored Troop, but he did command a United States Colored Troop Regiment. Delaney would say, years before the Civil War, but the time should yet come when the despised, neglected American patriots in spite of American prejudice, shall rise superior to the spirit that would degrade it and find its place on the records of merit and fame." Close quote. So even before the Civil War, they see themselves as patriots. Now I really want us to appreciate that's the perspective of these soldiers who are on occupation duty. This, I, in 1899, and I ran into this book while curating this exhibit in Chicago, Group, two soldiers wrote a book about their regiment, the Fighting Eighth, but they understood themselves as a product of history, of, of the military history of African Americans. And so they write a book on the history of the Illinois Eighth Volunteers, a National Guard unit that was deployed to doing, and with these two soldiers who wrote the book, they were deployed during the Spanish-American War. But they're referenced. Ever since Christmas Attics, the world has known that the black man has undaunted courage. In a word, he is the ideal soldier. Union generals Sherman and Sheridan have testified to the fact, after App Appomattox, General Rodney Lee appeared that without the aid of the Negro soldiers, the North could never have conquered him. And General McClellan said, give me an army of black men and I will defy the world. Now what I want you to focus on, this is their perspective of themselves. And this is what they're getting from their elders who are these, their mentors, who are these Civil War soldiers who were on occupation duty. So it's their perspective of themselves. So when we talk about these soldiers on occupation duty, this is going to be a bit of a different spin than what you'll nor normally get. It's from the perspective of the soldiers and what they thought of themselves and what their accomplishments were. Now when we talk about occupation duty, during the war and after the war, African American soldiers, United States colored troops, are on occupation duty in almost every slaveholding state. Or in the case of Maryland, they're on, um, 
they're actually pr prison prisoner war guards at Point Lookout. So they're not, actually not on occupation duty per se. But in, in Kentucky and Missouri, they actually are on occupation duty. And these are states that did not secede from the Union. So every slaveholding state, they have some presence during and after the war. Their first real assignment to occupation duty is with the first group of African American soldiers officially brought into the Union Army, and that is in Louisiana. When you read the Emancipation Proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation applies to ten states, the states that are in rebellion. However, there are exceptions. Twelve parishes in Louisiana are exempt from Also, some counties in, in Virginia, but I'm going to focus on the Louisiana parishes. These parishes have been functionally brought back into the Union. Under General Benjamin F. Butler, the mostly sugar planters and the local population have voted to send two representatives, two districts, two congressional districts from these parishes, send representatives to Washington. So as a consequence, they're considered back in the Union. They've returned to the Union. So they met President Lincoln's criteria. And so they are exempt from the Emancipation Proclamation. And Butler is the commander of the Department of the Gulf. He is headquartered in New Orleans. And what Butler does in 1862, August of 1862, is he brings two regiments of African American troops called the Louisiana Native Guards into federal service. He also commissions in these two regiments 60 African American officers. So all of the captains and lieutenants, all of the line officers in these two regiments are African American line officers. This is 1862, before the Emancipation Proclamation. Butler is highly successful in occupation duty. And how do we know he's highly successful? Those parishes that he's, in, in, that he's occupied or brought back in the Union exempt from the Emancipation Proclamation. That's testimony of how successful he is. Now, he's able to get the African American community to cooperate with him very well, mainly because he brings them into the Union Army, and again, he commissions these officers. Now, this creates a real problem in New Orleans. The occupying force in New Orleans with these African American officers, as he commissions these African American officers, there are some very esteemed women in uh, New Orleans that decide they want, to, they want to turn their pots on Union officers. Butler decides if, if they continue to do this, his decision is he's going to treat them like ladies of the night. And he arrests them. And therefore we get the nickname. Often we don't get the story on what the origin of the nickname is, but it actually begins with commissioning African American officers and the disrespect of these African American officers. I want you to appreciate how important what Butler has done as well in terms of uh, the African American community. When you commission an officer, you're not saying that you're just equal before the law. You're not saying you're equal. You're saying that in the military hierarchy, there are persons of accent who are superior in the, in the hierarchy. This is a, a move that no other general, not even the president, really thought to be this aggressive on at that point. Now, I do want to point out that President Abraham Lincoln would commission an African-American surgeon in October of 1862, but that's after Butler had done it. They're highly successful in occupation duty. Highly successful, as the testimony is in, the, in those parishes again, being brought back into the Union, exempt from the Emancipation Proclamation. But one of the things that blows Butler's mind is just how competent these soldiers are. He just can't understand it. Because many of the soldiers coming into, his, uh, into these regiments that he's just formed are actually quite competent. They were former enslaved persons. So he just can't understand it. But one thing he observed, quote, I observed a very remarkable trait about them. They learned to handle arms and to march more easily than intelligent white men. My drill master could teach a regiment of Negroes that much more of the art of war sooner than he could have taught the same number of students from Harvard or Yale, close quote. Now, Butler can't understand this. But I just want to briefly explain what's going on. When you look at the first regiments brought in to federal service during the Civil War, they're in Louisiana, Lower Mississippi. They're in South Carolina, Sea Islands. They're in Kansas, drawing on mostly the African bands of the Seminoles. Now, with each one of these groups, what you will find in primary source records 
are military officers from the Hausa and Fulani ethnic groups. And they mostly ran the plantations. In the case of the Seminoles, they were actually military commanders, so we should expect them to be high-performing soldiers. In Lower Mississippi on the Sea Islands, the African American, uh, correction, the African managers, like Salim Bill Ali, also known as Old Tom, or Colonel Abdul, or Ahmad Ibrahim Abin Sori, also known as Prince Abraham. When you look at records of their plantations, it's interesting when they, when they would wake up in the morning to go out to the field to work, to plant, or pick cotton, they would stand in formation early in the morning. If they had tools, they would put their tools at port arms, turn and jog out to the field, singing a cadence. Sounds like military, doesn't it? They're actually getting military training. And so Butler is really surprised at how confident they are, but they are highly competent. And these are, again, the first occupying United States colored troops are coming out of the Louisiana Native Guards and out in, Louisiana, out in South Carolina. In South Carolina, you have regiments that are organized internally, actually, correction, you have a company-sized unit organized under a gentleman by the name of Prince Rivers. David Hunter, when he becomes the commander in, in uh, early 1862, he issues an Emancipation Proclamation for the Department of the South, South, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, and br brings in a regiment. It is illegal for him to do that. This is before Butler is even down in New Orleans. David Hunter organizes a regiment from the Sea Island uh, group, the Sea Island group. Hunter is told to rescind his Emancipation Proclamation immediately, uh, his Emancipation immediately, and his regiment is not touched until Congress starts a congressional investigation. After the congressional investigation, May of 1862, he's told, you have to disband this regiment. In fact, they, they sent a query to him, is it true that you have organized a regiment of fugitive slaves? Hunter replied, it is not true that I have organized a regiment of fugitive slaves. I have, however organized a regiment of former slaves who have been abandoned by their fugitive masters. Hmm. <laughs> well, Congress laughed, but they said, you have to disband the regiment. Now, they're t in South Carolina, they're on occupation duty, but there's not a lot of interaction with the local population because most of the local population has actually abandoned their lands. Unlike what's happening in, in Louisiana. Louisiana, it's really occupation duty where there's interaction with local population. So that's a big difference. But in both cases, when you read about these soldiers, what is notable is that they're considered highly competent by their commanders. Indeed, when you begin to examine United States colored troops from official records and from what the soldiers think, it's a very different story than what we usually get in the way history has been presented on United States colored troops. General Grant would say of the United States Colored Troops when President Lincoln said, you know, I really want you to help recruit along the Mississippi. And Grant says, well, you know, I agree with this policy and that without their help, I could not have captured Vicksburg when, when I did July 4th, 1863. He goes on to tell the President, August of 1863, quote, by arming the Negro, we've added a powerful ally, close quote. And they're on occupation duty along the Mississippi after the capture of Vicksburg for the duration of the war. They're there. They, they have a presence. And they are the federal presence there in Mississippi and Louisiana. Uh, I just hit that button again. Now, one of the one of the difficulties in talking about United States colored troops in since 1989 is actually the movie Glory. It creates one of the biggest obstacles. Why? It's because it's a false presentation of what they were like, and it creates a real obstacle in telling the truth. And I'll just, I won't get into too many details, but I will say, in the movie, you notice they don't know their left foot from their right foot? Well, these are free men in the 54th Massachusetts, unlike the movie where they're enslaved men. That's not true. And if you go to the story of the enslaved men, both in Louisiana and in South Carolina, the reports are very different from what you'd see in the movie. But Robert Gulshaw says that when they came to camp, they were well drilled. The best drilled among them became my lead drill sergeants. His lead drill sergeant and Sergeant Major was Lewis Douglas, Frederick Douglass' eldest son. So no Irish drill sergeant like you saw in the movie didn't exist. 
Many of these soldiers have belonged to private militias in places like Harrisburg, where you had the Garnet Guards, a private militia since 1843, drilling here in Harrisburg. These are the kind of men that were in the 54th Massachusetts. Came to camp well drilled, the best drilled among them became my lead drill sergeants. So very different from the image in the movie. Also at the end of the movie, they say the fort was never taken. Well, there's occupation duty on Morris Island because that fort was taken. Now I've had many scholars argue and say, well, yeah, Harry, but they left the fort. And so it really wasn't taken. I'll deal with that a number of times because you hear this a lot when it comes to United States color troops. It's one of the strangest things in military history. I spent 21 years in the Marine Corps, and I've studied a lot of Marine Corps history. And anytime we run the enemy off a hill, and they abandon the hill, and we take the hill, we say we captured the hill. We say we took the hill. The Marine Corps never say, oh, we've chased them off the hill, but since they ran, we didn't capture it. That would be ridiculous in Marine Corps history. United States color troops, it's actually common for scholars to say things like that. And at the end of the movie Glory, they say the fort was never taken. Again, I know many scholars will argue with you. Well, it wasn't taken. Well, this is Corporal Gooding, and he talks about, he actually used take, taking possession. But I won't end there. This is a report from General Henry Halleck, his annual report at the end of 1863. This is General Chief of the Army, and I want you to notice his language. He talks about, saves in the morning, to, took possession, to use the term take, you know, he took possession, took possession, but he says that this out characterizes our great professional skill and boldness. The Fort Wagner was captured by 3rd United States Colored Troops out of Philadelphia, 2nd South Carolina Infantry of African Descent, and 54th Massachusetts on September 7th, 1860. And it showed skill and boldness. Also, what he says here, since the capture of Forts Wagner and Gregg, he has, he's talking about Gilmore, he has. Uh, enlarge these works and establish powerful batteries which effectually command Fort Sumter. In other words, they're able to stop the blockade runners from coming into Fort Sumter and to Charleston because they took Fort Wagner. Now, what I want you to appreciate is the esteem of these soldiers. These soldiers know they took it, though we may not know it from the way historians have presented this. And those who use the movie to teach students, we may not know this, but when we go to the primary sources, it becomes very different. We use the official records of the War of the Rebellion. And this is the esteem of the soldiers. And these are the soldiers that would be on occupation duty in South Carolina. And they see themselves as very victorious and, and, and very courageous soldiers. This is the way they're viewing themselves as soldiers, not as laborers. And I'll come back to that. By the spring of 1864, at Union Army has occupied what you see in the green and United States colored troops are on duty in every one of these areas. So in every one of these areas, they're on duty in some capacity. So they're part of an occupying force in almost every state in rebellion. That's 1864. It is often said that William Tecumseh Sherman, he didn't use colored troops. Actually, a group of African American soldiers are very important to Sherman and they're part of an occupying force in Tennessee. Sherman says of his Atlanta campaign that the great question of the Atlanta campaign was one of supplies. And he talked about the rail lines is what he's addressing from Louisville to Nashville and then of course Nashville following his army as it as it marches toward uh, Atlanta. Sherman would assign 11 United States Colored Troop Regiments to address this great question. And they are in Tennessee, they're in southern Kentucky, they're in northern Alabama, they're in uh, northern Georgia, guarding the rail lines, addressing the great question they are performing in such a way that in Sherman's memoirs, and I want to point out that Sherman is also often by scholars described as such a racist that he didn't use colored troops. That's how he's described. I, I can't tell you how many arguments I would have been in whether if I would engage in such an argument. I don't, if I have a primary source, I stop arguing with you and say, go look this up. After you read it, we'll talk. But I'm not going to argue with you because you've read some historian 
and have failed to view this valuable piece of inf military information. Sherman would write about those who guard Israel lines. I doubt whether the history of war can furnish more examples of skill and bravery than, than attended to the defense of the railroad from Nashville to Atlanta during the year 1864. Now, as a former intelligence officer, what do I do when he says this? See, he didn't say colored troops. So what do I do? I immediately go to order of battle to find out who the general is talking about. And when I go to order of battle, I find that who were the soldiers on occupation duty guarding the rail lines in Tennessee? United States color troops. So Sherman has such a high opinion of, but I want you to note the non-racist language, or racial, I don't want to use the term racist, non-racial language. He just says, he's just referring to the soldiers who do it. He's not calling about it. He's leaving that up to you to examine who they might be. That's our responsibility, but he's just talking about his soldiers. And with Grant and Sherman, you can find this to be a problem if you're looking for somebody to mention the colored troops, they typically do not. They typically mention their soldiers, and it's left up to you to go and find out who he's talking about, who they're talking about. And that's Sherman. United States colored troops by 1864 on occupation duty in battle have impressed every general that's in command. In Nashville, even George Thomas, the Virginian, that says, oh, it's, it's proven. The Negro will fight after the Battle of Nashville. But he'd also known what had happened during the summer and spring, uh, the summer and early fall of 64 in the defense of the rails. But it is Butler who's the biggest advocate of United States color troops. Again, we go back to Louisiana in 1862. In December of 1863, Butler is assigned the duties of the commander of the Department of Virginia and North Carolina and he's back at Fortress Monroe. He had been at Fortress Monroe early in the war in May of 1861. He had established the protocol on what they call contraband. You can ask me a question later on that. But he established the protocol on that. But Butler is now back and he's in charge. Now this is what Butler's opinion when he's in charge. He believes that better soldiers never shouldered a musket. This is what he believes about his colored troops. Butler also, I want to point out, when he takes command in December of 1863, of the Department of Virginia and North Carolina, United States color troops are not receiving equal pay. Butler orders that his quartermaster issue, or commissary officer, issues vouchers to the colored troops. So this compensates their pay. They can go to the commissary and get items with these vouchers. This is covering this inequity in pay. Also, Butler grants extra pay for extra duty to non-commissioned officers in the United States color troops. And in that same order, he admonishes Congress to change the laws. And I want to emphasize that because often when you hear scholars talk about United States color troops not receiving equal pay, often they will blame it on Abraham Lincoln as if the president writes legislation. He did sign it, but he did not write it. And when Butler or you read United States color troops addressing the issue of unequal pay, they never mention the president as being responsible. Why? It's because they understand how our system works. They know it was Congress that wrote that legislation. So they address Congress to pay. And I do want to point out that Congress does change or amend the Militia Act of 1862 in June of 1864, June 15th, awarding equal pay and arrears. Butler, with his troops there at, there at City Point and in positions in front of Petersburg and Richmond, he would, um, he would lead an assault on Newmark Heights, September 29, 1864, with United States color troops. Fourteen men he would cite for actions that merit the Medal of Honor. All 14 of them received the Medal of Honor. I, do, I want to point out that there were only 18 African American soldiers that received the Medal of Honor. Soldiers, to the compensators there. 18 African-American soldiers that received the Medal of Honor for acts of courage during the Civil War. Butler was responsible directly for 14 and indirectly for two others. So 16 of the 18. He also commissioned 77 of the 151 African-American officers. Now, the performance of United States color troops on occupation duty, in battle, 
has impressed everyone. When I say everyone, I'm not excluding the Confederacy. The Confederacy is complete. The Confederate officials are completely aware of how good they are. In fact, I want to present this just in a modern analogy. It's like Bear Bryant or SEC coaches in the 1960s and 70s. They knew that African Americans could perform. We want to change the rules. We want to change the laws. This is a letter from Henry Allen, the governor of Louisiana. Henry Allen, September of 1864, writes, the time has come for us to put into, into the army every able-bodied Negro man as a soldier. This should be done immediately. And he's telling the Confederate Congress to get to work on it. And then to address the question of whether they make good soldiers or not, Governor Allen would say, would write, we have learned from dear bought experience that Negroes can be taught to fight. In other words, they've been whipping us on the battlefield. They've been performing well. Let's not get into this argument. That's not doing it. I do want to point out that in lobbying the Confederate Congress, one of the people that joins this lobbying effort is General Robert E. Lee. Lee actually argues that the Negro is eminently qualified to be a soldier and seeks to have this change. Also, I want to point out at this time, September, October of 1864, you also see the protocol on how to treat United States colored troops who are captured as prisoners of war change. In December of 1862, after Butler had brought the first units in, and, and, uh, and after uh, the South Carolina Regiment was brought in, President Jefferson Davis issued a proclamation saying that Negro soldiers, uh, colored soldiers, would be returned to slavery, put to hard labor. So that was the protocol on how you treat prisoners of war who were, who were colored troops. Butler would do the same thing to Confederate soldiers. He would do exactly what you're going to do by colored soldiers. That's what Butler would do. And in October of 1864, General Robert E. Lee wrote a letter to General Ulysses S. Grant saying, we have changed our protocol. Now colored troops will be treated as prisoners of war. And it was because of Butler. After the Confederate legislature is clearly going to pass legislation. Now, I want to point out that Governor Allen is actually saying that I would free all able, able to bear arms. So what does that mean? That means that the, he's advising, and this is what is in the Confederate legislation on bringing men of Africa into the Confederate Army, that it is also an emancipating legislation. If you join the Confederate Army, you are free, forever free. Your wife and children are forever free. Lincoln is concerned about this legislation because one of his weapons, if you will, against the Confederacy is the Emancipation Proclamation. And now the Confederacy has their own form of Emancipation Proclamation for military service. Martin Delaney, Dr. Delaney, from Pittsburgh, also one of the heads of an organization I'll mention later called the Loyal League, very important as a, in the part of the occupying force. It's a secret African-American organization. He's really the operations officer. He goes to Washington, meets with President Lincoln. He tells President Lincoln, that part of the Underground Railroad, known only unto ourselves, can prevent enlistment into the Confederacy. But in order for the leaders to be successful, the federal government must show its good faith by assigning us positions commensurate with our abilities and contributions. Delady then proceeds to hand President Lincoln letters of recommendation. President Lincoln tells him, I, I don't need any letters of recommendation from you. I know all about you. And President Lincoln proceeded to order his Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, to commission Martin Delaney as a major in the regular army. He is an infantry officer in the regular army commissioned directly from President Lincoln in February of 1865. But I do want to point out that when Delaney is commissioned, Delaney makes it a point to say that, Mark, that William Howard Day deserved a position higher than him. William Howard Day is a major player. He becomes a citizen of... Harrisburg, after the war, there's a cemetery named after, a housing project named after him. William Howard Day is from New York, but hear what Delaney has to say. Was chosen to arrange military policy of the Underground Railroad relative to slave enlistment. 
perform the task with ability and earnestness. So this is the this is the top guy. This is the commander. The Loyal League, the secret organization, is very important in how things are run in occupation. And I do want to point out one of the characteristics of the Loyal League is that, and they actually boast of this, is that while the men of the plantations are out fighting, I'm talking about Confederate soldiers, Confederate officers, they make it a point to keep the wives of those Confederate soldiers safe and their children safe. This is a boast of the Loyal League even after the war. They would boast that they kept the non-combatants, the innocents, safe. Now this is a very good example for people on occupation duty. But that's the example they would say, excuse me. And that's the Loyal League at work. Very important in occupation duty. When Delaney is commissioned in February of 1865, Charleston is captured. The first unit to enter Charleston is the 21st United States Colored Troops. The soldiers in the 21st United States Colored Troops are from South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. They are followed by the 55th Massachusetts Colored Infantry. And that's actually this print coming out of Frank Leslie's Illustrated. Entering Charleston. And there are some who say, well, the Confederates abandoned Charleston, so it really wasn't captured. I would just go to the official records. This is what General Gilmore, the commander of the Department of the South, had to say. He calls it in honor of the capture of Charleston. So since he says capture, I'm just going to repeat the general. Now, in the orders they actually talk about in occupation duty. This order in the Department of the South, focusing mostly on Savannah, is saying that when we divide up the duties, it'll be between white and colored alike. So the provost or police duty, uh, labor duties. So they, they want to make sure in the commands that no one's just sending African American troops, the colored troops, on just labor duty. I know that's the impression we get because it was a problem. But one of the things we, there's a tendency for some scholars to do is they, they're trying to make a point. So they'll identify the problem and they'll actually use an official report or, or soldier's complaint as the problem, but they won't tell you what the command did to solve the problem. And so a lot of this, when colored troops were assigned a lot of heavy labor duty, and they weren't given their fair share of what I'm going to call more military-like duties, this was addressed by the upper command. And this is an example of the command addressing it and saying that when it comes to duty, it's going to be shared, white and colored alike. That's the command solution to it. So we do have a problem, so when people report the problem, that's accurate, but it's important for us to continue to follow, uh, follow that chain of letters and orders that deal with that problem. Here in this, uh, this order, they're telling you where various units are assigned on occupation duty. This is in May of 1865. You've got the uh, 54th and 55th Massachusetts that are in Charleston. The 31st is in, Char in Charleston. Uh, the 32nd is in uh, Buford. Now, I focus on 32nd. That's a Pennsylvania unit. It's in Buford. You have another uh, Pennsylvania unit, the 3rd, that's in Savannah on occupation duty. The 3rd also goes into Tallahassee. They go in in May of 1865 and occupy the capital of Florida. One of the privates in the regiment talks about the Rebs seem to die very hard at the idea of, be, of having black troops guard them, but they have been very quiet and do not have much to say. How true is the saying that we know not what a day may, might, may bring forth great changes are being wrong. Now I do want to point out that he goes on to say, now he's from, he's, this is the third United States Colored Infantry from Pennsylvania. African Americans do not have the right to vote in Pennsylvania. Private William Johnson, he says, there's only one thing I want of all of this. As he's down there on occupation duty, there's only one thing I want. That is the vote. Let us see what time will bring. Also down in Charleston is Major Martin Delaney. He gets assigned to Charleston. Initially, his assignment is to go down and recruit. So he, he gets his orders May 5th, 1865 to go down to uh, Charleston and recruit. Now he sets up his headquarters. Now there's, this is iron, ironic. 
his headquarters in Charleston when he's recruiting and the headquarters where United States colored troops are being housed in the barracks is the Citadel. Now, if you're familiar with some Citadel historians like Walker and others, they say the colored troops didn't do anything to free themselves, that African Americans did nothing to free themselves. But yet, in fact, well, I won't get into that. But yet, they're actually occupying the Citadel. And that's where Delaney's headquarters was. That's where his recruiting office was in Charleston. It was the Citadel. And for you that go to, to, uh, to Charleston today, the old Citadel is where the Embassy Suites is. That's the old citadel, not the new, new location, away from the city. United States colored troops are on provost duty, and the provost marshal, one of the provost marshals in, uh, in uh, South Carolina is none other than Major Martin Delaney. The 104th United States colored troops is a regiment that all of the officers, I'm going to use all, then I'm going to tell you how to do that word. All of the officers, commander, executive officer, were African Americans. This is during the Civil War. Delaney was the commander. Now notice I said all of the officers, then I said commander and executive officers. All of his lieutenants and acting lieutenants and captains were enlisted men from the 54th, 55th Massachusetts, 3rd United States Colored Infantry, uh, <laughs> from these other units that were there. They were non-commissioned officers and in one case private, Delaney's son, were acting officers, but they never got commissions. So in that regiment, the regiment had 1,700 men, but they only had two actual commissioned officers. OSB Walls out of Ohio, Captain OSB Walls, and Major Martin Delaney. Both got their commissions from the War Department in Lincoln, not from the state. But they're on provost duty. And so they are, they are, the law in occupied South Carolina. They are the law, and Delaney is the major, so he also acts as a judge. So if you are a planter and you have not made the correct deal, and there are a number of cases of this, with your former enslaved, you're not paying them, you're, you have to go to court. And your judge is Major Martin Delaney. <laughs> There are complaints about this. Okay. Now, one of the things also, this, this was considered, occupation duty was considered very, very important. After the war, after the cessation of, of hostilities, occupation duty was considered very, very important. The presence of colored troops was considered very important. Frederick Douglass did a speech in Boston, the Anti-Slavery Society, said that, you know, the only reason they're loyal because of the 200,000 sable soldiers that are down there. That's why, that's why. Don't, don't think that they've just given up and the rebels aren't still re rebellious. If we're not there, then it's... And this is also begs a, 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 let's say, this is addresses a question that often some contemporary scholars will complain that African American soldiers weren't in the Grand Review in Washington in May of 1865. Well, that's not true, one, because the 135th was in the review. It's in the official records, again, using official records. And so, the soldiers who put, they actually have it in their pension records, too. I've seen over 40 who said I was there, and then I found them in the orders. But that said, it's important to note that if you look for any complaints of not being in the Grand Review, you will not find it from contemporaries. You will not find it from African-American contemporaries, African-American leaders, or African-American soldiers. You do not find it. Why? Because they wanted to be on occupation duty because they knew how important it was. Just as Frederick Douglass is saying here. They know how important it is. If you want to ensure emancipation, you want to ensure that the former enslaved are going to get paid for a day's work, you must have a federal presence and that these United States colored troops, that's where they wanted to be, enforcing the law. Enforcing the law. Enforcing policy. Now, I want to come back to Butler. Because we've talked about South Carolina, we've mentioned Louisiana. I want to talk about Virginia. In Virginia, Butler organizes the 25th Army Corps. Coming back to the, the Department of Virginia, North Carolina, he would form the Army of the James and the 25th Army Corps. Organized in late 1864 is the only Army Corps in the history of the United States made up of only African American regiments. It was commanded by General Godfrey Weitzel. And I mentioned, I was speaking to someone earlier, and I said, let's talk about how African Americans got a lot of the bad duty, labor, etc. 
It depends on what command you're in. And if you're in, in Butler's command, oh, you do not get that. In fact, Butler would say, in this army you have been treated not as laborers but as soldiers. You have shown yourselves worthy of the uniform you wear. The best officers in the Union seek to command you. Your bravery has won the admiration of even those who would be your masters. Talking about Confederate policy changing. Your patriotism, fidelity, and courage have illustrated the finest, the best qualities of manhood. With the bayonet, you have unlocked the iron bar gates of prejudice, opening new fields of freedom, liberty, and equality to yourselves and your race forever. They would be on the front lines in front of Petersburg and Richmond. And on April 2nd, 1862, on the front lines, they would be the first to enter Petersburg, capturing and occupying Petersburg. On April 3rd, 1865, United States colored troops would capture and occupy Richmond, Virginia. Now, again, it's one of those things where I run into people, well, the Confederacy, the Confederates left Richmond. So they really didn't capture it. This is what the newspaper had to say, a daily <coughs> Republican, Washington, D.C. Extra glorious fall of Richmond, captured by the black troops. Well, that's the newspaper. So it's not a military. But I just want you to know what, the, what, the, what was being announced to the public through the media. Garland White, interesting story. I just want to briefly share Garland White's story. Garland White was actually born in Virginia, right outside of Richmond. He was sold at a public auction in Virginia at the age of 10 years old to a Georgia planter, taken down to Georgia, became a man's servant when his so-called honor became a senator. He came to Washington with the senator, Washington, D.C. He attempted to escape, failed in his attempted escape, was taken back, promised that he wouldn't try it again, and with the help of then senator from New York, William Seward, he escaped made his way to Canada, became a pastor in the AME Zion Church, and became the chaplain of the 28th United States Colored Troops in October of 1864. In April of 186, April 3rd, 1865, Garland White, sold away from his mother and family at 10 years old, is the head of the column. He leads his regiment into Richmond. Marching down Main Street that early morning, an elderly woman spotted him. She went to a Union soldier and asked, who is that young man leading those soldiers? He looks like my young daughter. That was Garland White's mother. His homecoming, his reunion, was on the day he led the liberating force, the occupying force, into Richmond, Virginia. And we get a story from his own pen. Now, there are literally hundreds of stories like this about this occupying army. That when they go in and occupy various rebel territory, they're emancipating their own families. They're being reu reunited with their own families. Garland White's one of the most dramatic. Because here we have a Union officer reunited with his family. Again, we get his story from his own pen. A native of Harrisburg, who's also working as a journalist writing for the Philadelphia Press under the pseudonym uh, Rowland, Thomas Morris Chester, he would write that General Draper's uh, brigade deserved the credit. And he goes on to say the 36 United States Colored Troops, which was out, were made up of soldiers from Virginia and North Carolina, would lead the occupying force, capturing force, into Richmond, Virginia. And General Godfrey Weitzel would say the 25th Corps not only entered Richmond first, but Petersburg also. Now, I also want to point out that General Grant writes that in his memoirs. But for those who say it wasn't captured, this is where I go to say, I just read General William Tecumseh Sherman when he said, consequent on the capture of Richmond. That means he thought they was captured. So I'm going to trust Sherman. I'm going to trust Sherman to understand what was going on militarily. So Richmond was captured. He was captured by the 25th Army Corps. I also want to point out that in the press, though Butler is no longer in command of the Army of the James, in the press they're giving credit to General Butler. It was organized that the, the 25th Corps of the Army of the James, organized by General Butler, go as first and, and captured Richmond. And General Butler has been called upon today to talk about the accomplishments of these troops. So he was being recognized in this newspaper, a Republican newspaper. I say that because Butler at the beginning of the war was a Democrat. He would later become a Republican uh, congressman uh, after the war. 
and then a Democratic governor of Massachusetts. So you see, he switched uh, based on what was best for Butler. Uh, Lee retreating, Grant pursuing, it's the 25th Army Corps that leads this pursuit of Lee. A brigade of the 25th Army Corps, and they stopped Lee's army just south and west of a place called Appomattox Courthouse along the uh, Lynchburg Road. Early morning of April 9th, 1865. The 41st United States Colored Troops out of the great state of Pennsylvania would be the lead element. Skirmish Lee's army, five hour skirmish. After five hours of skirmishing, Lee discerns he can no longer continue to prosecute the war. Later that day, he would surrender to General Robert E. Lee at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. Eleven United States Colored Troops present. Because they stopped Lee at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia on that early morning skirmish. And Lee didn't, couldn't go the other way, which most people would talk about. But he could have turned and ran, but he had a problem because Sheridan was coming down that way from the Shenandoah Valley. So he, he had no way out. But the 25th Army Corps is immediately on occupation duty in Virginia from April of 65 until May of 65. Now, what happens in May of 65? Well, General Weitzel gets an order that to have his people ready to board ocean transportation, ocean liners, at City Point. He gets this on May 18th, four days before the Grand Review in Washington, I want to add. But he gets word that they're going to, they should stand ready. And what are they standing ready for? Well, Thomas Morris Chester says, the Negro Corps under General Weitzel has received marching orders, is well known throughout their camps and they are beginning to put on the war paint with the impression that they are going to Texas. They look forward to the period of embarkation with a great deal of satisfaction. No, he's not complaining about being in some parade in Washington. Because now they get to go out to Texas and enforce the law. They're excited about this, this assignment to occupation duty in Texas and bringing Texas back into the Union where the governor, Fran Francis uh, Pendleton, has decided he's not really going to go along with Lee's surrender. He's trying to talk his generals into continuing to prosecute the war. They're telling him, no, that doesn't make any sense. So the 25th Army Corps goes out there. The first elements get out there in late May, early June, they're there. And by June 15th, the governor of Texas and 10,000 rebel soldiers are chased out of Texas into Mexico. And the 25th Army Corps is present. In fact, most people say that on June 19th, 1865, how many heard of Juneteenth? They say, well, that's when the word got to Texas? Well, that's not true. The telegraph was around since 1861. So the word got there kind of immediately on, if you know what I mean, especially since at what we now call El Paso uh, was a, a, a Union fort. So the word was in Texas before. But what's interesting is that the 25th Army Corps Brigade was there when, when uh, General Gordon Granger shows up. They're on occupation duty already. They're already out there. Granger would issue General Order Number 3 saying that the Emancipation Proclamation applied. And see, this is, General Order Number 3 is important. In fact, he was under, Sheridan gave orders to Granger that when he gets to Texas, he needs to tell the citizens of Texas that the laws of the U.S. government apply to Texas. And that includes the Emancipation Proclamation. That was his duty. That's what General Order Number 3 is. It's not saying, oh, we're going to finally inform you that the proclamation was issued. No, you're informed that you're now occupied. And we govern the state of Texas. That we are an occupying force. That's what Granger's General Order Number 3 is about. It's asserting federal authority in Texas. Garland White of the 28th United States Coast Troops, he gets sent out to Texas. He's sent out there with the rest of the 25th Army Corps. And there are some who are complaining. And this is what he has to say about the soldiers who are complaining and wanting to go home. City-minded men talk sometimes about home. And I have to remind them that all will come right in the end. At the same time, feeling in my own heart, that unless we are made equal before the law, we have got no home. But I want you to notice he doesn't, he's not talking about equality. He's talking about equality before the law. I really want you to appreciate that because when you track these soldiers and start listening, they, they don't have this sense that government's going to make us equal. No, the government's going to behave in such a way as it treats us equal before the law. We can sit on juries. We can testify. We can bring suits. That's what equality before the law, that's what his push is. 
At the end of the war, there are African Americans on occupation duty in 1865 in almost every state that was in rebellion. Even in Kentucky. This is a soldier in Kentucky. And one of the things that Sergeant Warfield is saying is that this is July of 1865. Sergeant Warfield is saying that this is the first 4th of July that we actually get to celebrate. This is a 4th of July that now we actually, it, it, we are actually a part of the nation's day. That this is our holiday too. That the cause of freedom, and, and this is interesting because when you listen to the soldiers, and, and this is, uh, I would challenge you to compare this with some contemporaries. Uh, they don't complain and say the Declaration of Independence wasn't true. No, no. They say the Declaration of Independence set a course of action for the nation. And that they view the Declaration of Independence as a weapon to be used against tyranny. To be used against slavery. So they're saying, oh, Jefferson, we're mad at you because you, you, weren't, uh, you, 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 you didn't free all your slaves. No, Jefferson, we thank you for giving us this weapon. And so that's how they viewed it. And then on the 4th of July, 1865, they said, okay, now we can celebrate. It may have taken since 1776. It may have taken this bloodshed and this new birth of freedom. But now this is our holiday as well. And so that's what Sergeant Warfield is, is saying as he's on occupation duty in Kentucky. In Louisiana, in the northern part of the state, you could, the, the soldiers testified that you could really see what the ravages of war, but also slaveholding, had done. That it, it, was, it was most bitter, and things were things were very difficult there. This is a that soldier is actually the soldier here is actually from Pennsylvania, but he was serving in uh, Corporal Henry was serving in a Rhode Island regiment. The chaplain here is out of a New York regiment, and they're in northern, <laughs> northern Louisiana. And I just like what he says. This section of the country presents a vivid picture of the desolating effects of the slaveholders' rebellion. But thank God there is one fact demonstrated here. The freemen can care for themselves. However, there was federal assistance. It was through the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was established under the Lincoln administration. 1865, March of 1865, and Congress passed the legislation to establish it. General Oliver Otis Howard, the Christian general, the upright general, was, was head of the Freedmen's Bureau, also the founder of Howard University in Washington, D.C. But President Andrew Jackson, the Democrat, Andrew Johnson, excuse me, the Democrat who was Lincoln's vice president, he listened to the planters, and he, they resented the presence of the United States Colored Troops on occupation duty. Resented it. And Johnson begins to pull colored troops out in the summer of 1865. By the fall of 1865, the end of the fall of 1865, almost all United States Colored Troops have been pulled out of occupation duty. They're still on duty in New Mexico and Texas to February of 1867, but they're really running border patrols. Mexico is still at war with France, and they're running border patrols and working in that capacity. So this is really the end of occupation, is when Johnson starts pulling them out. And what changes occur? Well, I'm going to go to Garland White, because Garland White sees what's happening. He says, Texas fever or no fever. My hope is that I may never see Ohio again unless less than a man. I cannot believe that any of the legislators will endorse what is already being done in some, if not all, the southern states. What is he talking about? He's saying that when Congress comes back in session, they're not going to put up with what Johnson is doing. And Johnson is doing this while Congress is not in session. And one of the things that Johnson has done, he's returning power to the secessionist Democrats. Slaveholders. And what do they do? They establish these vagrant laws. And what the vagrant laws is a method of mass incarceration in order to extract labor from the former enslaved. This is a Democratic Party policy. And that's what Johnson and the Southern Democrats are doing. And White is saying, I can't believe the legislature is going to happen, let this happen. I do want to point out that the Loyal League is going to work, mostly in secret meetings, but they call themselves the National, National Equal Rights League. They're also known as the Loyal League, Legal League, or Lincoln's Loyal League, Lincoln's Legal Loyal League, or the four L's. 
They go to work. Some of the headliners of these are William Howard Day, Abraham Galloway, Thomas Morris Chester, Caesar Antoine, who was a captain during the Civil War, Jonathan Wright, and you see some of the accomplishments of those men during the Reconstruction era. These are some of the people in, Nur in Neural trying to fight against what's going on. And I do want to point out in closing that when Congress comes back in session, they do exactly what, what Chaplain White said. He said he doesn't believe the legislators have got a lot of that. The Republican Congress immediately, immediately removes as quickly as they can those Democrats from power in the South. The rescind those vagrant laws and mass incarceration does not become a problem again until 1975. Just want to point that out. Because it was addressed by the legislators. But occupation duty was over. The only African Americans you have on occupation duty after that are colored regulars. The 38th and 39th colored regulars, 38th, 39th regiments were in, South, in North Carolina and they would get assignments throughout wherever they were needed. I mean like all the regulars would on occupation duty. The 41st and, uh, and 40th and 41st would uh, be on assignment out in Louisiana. These are infantry regiments and they would be, cons they would be uh, downsized where the 38th and 39th becomes the 24th, correction, the 25th infantry and the 40th and 41st becomes the 24th infantry in, in 1869. Then they would be start moving out west where the 9th and 10th Cavalrys had been in Louisiana, Missouri, Indian Territory on occupation duty in Indian Territory. In fact, become a major part of law enforcement in Indian Territory. And so they would remain on occupation duty as colored regulars in Indian Territory until well after, uh, actually until Oklahoma Territory was established in the 1880s. But 1877 is when the federal troops were pulled out of the South after the Rutherford v. Hayes Compromise. And so that's when federal troops are out. But United States Colored Troops, their occupation came to an end in the fall of 1865 for all practical reasons. Though their last regiments mustered out were in New Mexico and Texas in February of 1867. That's occupation duty during and after the war of the rebellion. Thank you for your time. Thank you.